Okay, I think we'll get started. If Ahmad, you're ready to go. Yeah, I'll share my screen. May I? Uh, sure, yeah. So I'm just going to introduce Ahmad. Welcome everybody to the Present Your Thesis uh, dissertation event. Uh, my name is Michelle Duong, one of the co-coordinators for the SIPA Emerging Professionals. I'm here with Elise Hamp from Carleton University, who will be hosting uh, this uh, session with me today, and we have a lot of experts joining us um, who we will introduce uh, later in the session. So let me go ahead and introduce Ahmad. Ahmad Mohammed is a PhD candidate in the Department of Archaeology at Durham University. He completed his Master of Science in Egyptology from the University of Fayoum in 2020 and has a Diploma in African Anthropology from Cairo University in 2021. And his PhD research focuses um, is in ethnoarchaeology, heritage conservation, heritage management, and he's worked as a field archaeologist in the uh, Sayes, Sayes <laughs> excavation Sayes, mission. Yeah, yeah. Sayes, thank you, excavation mission uh, in Egypt since 2019. So we're very excited for your um, presentation today. So if you want to go ahead and share your screen, Ahmad will be presenting on design and spatial organization of pottery workshops in Egypt and ethno-archaeological study. And go ahead. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Morning, afternoon, and evening from wherever you are joining us today for this lecture and uh, presentation. So uh, as Michelle has introduced me, I'm a PhD candidate at Durham University. And I'm working on the uh, um, design and spatial organization of pottery workshops in Egypt uh, as an archaeological study. Uh, so uh, for, for ancient Egypt and contemporary Egyptian potters, they are somehow uh, related to each other. And um, we have like continuation between the techniques, uh, workshops, uh, components, and uh, many things. So uh, the um, working on on pottery workshops in ancient and contemporary uh, Egypt which was neglected and to draw less attention to early scholars I mean here the uh, arch uh, Egyptologists at that time who were more interested in uh, studying the magnificent pyramids temples palaces and uh, uh, tombs scattered all over of Egypt uh, as you know so in addition workshops were likely to eliminate the uh, developing of the country's chronology that was was the case. So up until the scholars started to draw emphasis on the uh, settlements, archaeology, and daily life, which lead to the increase of importance of uh, pottery workshops. So we need to understand how, um, what are the main components of these workshops, how we, uh, the ancient potters managed to uh, organize it, and how they have been navigating, how the, uh, the production line, how the use of space of these places. So uh, likely we have found up to 30 workshops in, from ancient Egypt in many uh, excavated sites, most of it actually in Upper Egypt. So uh, we also have the contemporary poetry uh, workshops, which is uh, actually giving us a chance to um, interpret the ancient poetry uh, workshops. So we have many opportunities here, having the uh, contemporary uh, uh, pottery workshops give us uh, many opportunities like documentation, whether it is ethnographic uh, or digital documentation, or even both. And it gives us a chance to understand the vast technology and interpreting the possible manufacturing techniques and potter's social life and organization. In addition, interpreting uh, workshops at design and spiritual organization. But we also have challenges. Poachers are currently uh, abandoning their craft for many reasons. For example, low demand on their products, environmental restrictions, uh, because they, you know, they, they can emit a lot of toxic uh, emissions in in the in, uh, in the air. So, um, environment, you know, like Ministry of, of Environment, preventing them for from firing their products. So we are running out of time, and we may even miss the chance to uh, take these opportunities and to document. Uh, this heritage craft and to understand and interpret the their uh, heritage uh, workshops and understand their ancestors in ancient Egypt. So, 
Uh, I made my move and I've started uh, study contemporary workshops uh, sites to seize these opportunities. So I studied the Potter's uh, social life organization, then, it's, then the site itself and workshops. I'm over to production. So we, we can understand the, the, the social organization, the history and the family tree and when they started and when and how the uh, uh, more of the uh, have been apprenticed throughout their life and then uh, know about the craft uh, itself. And we studied the site itself to understand the workshop, to understand the spiritual organization and use of space and of course the uh, production. So the main question of this research is how did ancient Egyptian potters manage to organize and design their workshops? First, we could just do, and in order to answer this question, we can just, uh, first we, we, we document the contemporary pottery production and workshops for, for sure, and then we make the analysis for uh, the spiritual and social organization of pottery workshops as well. Fortunately, most of the products require a number of sets uh, manufacturing stages, and this can be observed ethnographically and inferred archaeologically. Sorry. Yeah. So the research design is a multi strategy approach uh, composed of uh, ethnoarchaeology, Chani Bortois, and uh, cases study and experimental archaeology. So the techniques is video and audio recording, photo photography, photogrammetry, GIS, semi structure interviews, and participant observation. So for the pottery workshop, generally, we have two kinds of styles of manufacturing or techniques. So the wheel making and hand making, which is pura. But then we, if we are going to uh, documenting it, we need, uh, we need to have like a set of frames that we follow, which is a chain of toi or uh, sequential operations to understand the early phases of production up to uh, becoming uh, a fired product, then selling it, and then we understand the uh, object life cycle from it. So one of these uh, sites that I've studied is in Nazla, which is located in uh, El Fayum, which is about like 100 kilometers from uh, Cairo, which is the capital of Egypt. and. Yeah, so Nasla Potters are not only are not the only potters in Fayum region. There are two other sites uh, who produce pottery, uh, namely Komushim and Tunis. Both sites produce pottery using modern techniques. Moreover, their main raw material are marl clay, which is different from the clay used in a Nasla, which is Nile silt. Uh, first of all, Nasla uh, products are mainly for household use, while the other sites are mainly for decoration purposes. Um, as you can see, the all the workshops are scattered all over the plain here. So they are located inside the uh, in the Nazla, and this is like a foot plane for for here for this canal, and they are all located or scattered all over the site near to the uh, water canal. And this is actually it's it's a perfect location for manufacturing pottery because manufacturing pottery requires a lot of water, so they need to have access to water and um, that they can use it in manufacturing. So in the Nazla, the, for at least like nine generations have been uh, in this side, have been uh, inhabiting this side. And actually they, they, are, they, they have told me that we are the first inhabitants of this place and we have been uh, working on pottery for all over like uh, I think like about 600 years now. So they have been, they have a history, a long history in producing pottery in the traditional uh, techniques. So but the to understand the, the decline of uh, the pottery production in the site, we, we know that there is, there had like, the site had like about 30 workshops served for the Nazla community of about 100 potter but, and assistant as well. But at the beginning of the 21st day, uh, 21st century, about 50 subfamilies of al Farh family were working in the site. And uh, in Alfein, in, in the, tw uh, sorry, in 2000s, each family of like four to six members, then the number decreased up to 12 families. So we moved from uh, about 50 families just to 12 families working in the site in, the, in 2013. And now we just have eight families working in the site. So we're about to miss the chance to document this uh, craft, to understand this social organization, the social life. Um, yeah, so 
my my research is doing ethnographic study documenting the site using the 3D photogrammetry and using GIS for spatial analysis. For the part for ethnographic uh, field work, I don't know whether we have a time for explaining the whole production process, but I'll just go uh, really fast in this, in this section. And if anyone wants to discuss this section uh, in much more uh, detail, so we just email me and we can have even a meeting or so we can have it. Yeah, so for the poetry production of this site, we have, uh, I will be just reporting the poorer production styles, which is the uh, hand making styles. So we have about like six styles, which is these six styles used in, as, as I mentioned before, it's mainly for uh, household uh, uh, production. Okay. Uh, like canon, which is a boat stove, uh, bokla, which is a semi-spherical jar used for uh, water uh, storage or milk storage, as the other one as well. And we have the zela, which is for Beijing be towers, and we have bowl, which is used for many purposes. So this kind of, all of these styles used to be used in the household in, in ancient Egypt and contemporary. Like 50 years ago, most of the houses in Egypt used these styles, but because of the development nowadays we, we all witness, we start to move to other tools uh, and um, yeah, containers. Uh, before we get started, I just want to highlight the main components of the workshops. So we have the main, the main workshop and forming paths, and we have the like terrace, which is having like another forming uh, pits, and we have the potter wheel. We have an open ear, an open ear drying zone here, and we have storage rooms for weight storage or clover, and uh, maybe also for the fired products. And we have the building pits outside the uh, the workshop, and of course the can itself. So for reporting the sequential operations, as I mentioned before. It is actually uh, something that if you go in detail, of it, the, the time for this lecture will not be enough. But generally, we have the raw material uh, procurement. So the raw material procurement to start from getting the clay to the site and then getting the ash, which is part of the timber uh, and tufla. Tufla is a marl clay, actually. So all of these components mix it together, and then we have the clay used for production. Since the material is very heavy as well as bulky, the quantities of the transported uh, can sometimes be a reflection for the scale of production and how can, uh, how much uh, products can this uh, specific workshop can produce for us. And also we have the uh, uh, the temper as well as the straw and chaff. Um, but this is actually indicate us like technical uh, choices. So if we we have two choices here, first of all is removing that plastic material, which is this, uh, like shells or pieces of calcite, gum some from, from the clay, and this will lead to thermal shock resistant products. Or we can just uh, adding a plastic material like sand or crashed stone or dung or even chaff so that we have like porous products. So it really depends at this stage, you just want to know which kind of timber that I'm going to use and it's related to which kind of product style that I'm going to uh, manufacture. Um, for the clay pre preparation, he gets he gets the uh, water from the nearby canal and then adding it to the valley pet, mixing it together, and then removing all the impurities from the clay and mixing it and leaving it. So this actually happens usually during the end of his day, and then in the next day he start to mixing it and uh, preparing it for uh for, for to be used in uh production generally just know that the nile salt is about 90 percent of ancient egyptian ceramics or pottery have been uh, of uh, nine salt products which is usually called nile salt wares and for malik lay limited range of wares so we don't have like it's actually the 10 uh, the, ten, the other 10 percent so, so when you come to the other day, the second day uh, of working, so we're getting the clay, getting the, the clay out of the bottling pit and starting to uh, uh, adding some ash to it and then starting to kneading it. And in order to make it more, uh, to getting rid of the trapped air and make it more 
uh, uh, like uh, easy to be formed. And then he knows that the clay is ready to be manufactured or use it, it is ready to be used for manufacturing. But when he sees no uh, no sign for the ashes like this one, as as you can see. So afterwards, he covered it with with uh, a wetted cloth and uh, and um, a plastic coverings, and then he started to uh, keep keep moving it, keep rolling it until he has a cylindrical shape. And then, before we go to the manufacturing process itself, I just want to highlight the main tools that he used. First of all, the mold. And actually, we do have two kind of molds here. The opener mold that he's using uh, while forming the the, uh, the clay itself in order to have his own style, and the softer one. This is being used in a, a different stage of manufacturing um, while he's doing this on the forming bed. And we have the uh, MBT uh, metal can. This, this actually is being used to just cleaning the forming bed. And we have the water here, which is being used while forming and we have a wooden tool which is called tara which is using just to for uh smoothing the outer uh size of the outer surface of the uh um of the product okay and then after making this cylindrical shaped products he start to move to his forming bed getting the specific amount of clay starting to bench again with the mold and moving until he uh, uh, reach to a specific size and then you can notice in the uh, picture five he even can use his legs to, his feet sorry uh, while forming and actually the use of, of his feet now is really uh, different from uh, a product style or a size of a product to another if it's so large so the, his feet is now just uh, trying to close the uh, the rim of of uh, of the product itself, but if it's medium sized, so just the, his feet just supporting forming of 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 the bed itself. Oh, sorry, of the uh, product itself. And then when you reach to this is another view for for uh, for the production of the, and using uh, the production of the products on on the forming bed. But here it is really important to notice. Uh, uh, picture number six, uh, six and seven while because in all this stage from one to six he's just moving from counterclockwise direction and using the opener mold but after reaching to uh, this phase which is in in uh, picture seven he start to work clockwise direction and using the opener mold which is softer and lighter so that he can smooth smoothing the uh, inner side of a uh, the product itself and then using the tara to smooth the outer uh, outer surface and also to make sure that it's it's all in oval shape and well manufactured after manufacturing it and before uh, carrying it outside the workshop to be dried he start to pinching it a little bit to have a joint trim and this trim actually we can't we can't trace in the in archaeological context, but we know from ethnographic study now he made like a very joint a joint trim so that it can receive the permanent rim later on. And after forming it, he can move the, the, the pot outside, and then he has another pit outside the workshop with the same diameter for the pit inside for the for the fermic pit inside in order just to to keep the the shape of uh, of the of the product itself uh, in the in a perfect uh, style and perfect size. Okay, and then he move again to his building bed, getting some clay, adding more marl clay to it, and then make it a little bit smoother, and then transferring it or transporting it to his wheel in order to adding the rim to it. Okay, so adding the rim, he just getting the clay, getting the 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 semi dried. Uh, but that he just form it and uh, putting it on the on the wheel and start to moving it a little bit here in order to make sure that it won't move or it won't fall from the from the wheel and start to make a fatil which is like a cylindrical shape of clay and then start to adding it while moving the the the, the wheel with his legs he keep kicking the leg uh, kicking the uh, the wheel of uh, the, the wheel itself and forming with both both hands until he reached to the perfect uh, size and perfect uh, style of the of the rim itself 
It's worth mentioning here, the REM is very important from a archaeological perspective because from the REM, we can identify uh, the, the product cell and even we can uh, identify, uh, even from ethnographic uh, perspective, who, who is the butcher that who managed to or who was responsible to manufacture uh, this uh, pottery. And, uh, and then he, later on, he just moved it to outside to be dried. Okay, so in, in winter, they, they covered the products with, uh, with sacks uh, or with uh, plastic covering in order to prevent, uh, prevent it to being, uh, uh, for being destroyed by the rain or, or so. And then we come to the phase, which is the firing phase. So we have the can, and we have uh, here. We I need to highlight the main uh, parts of the of the can itself, which is the pottery. This is the pottery box. So we have this is the outer side of of, of the can, and we have the pottery box. We have perforated floor, and we have a firing box, and we have here upper pottery aperture and firing feeding aperture. So and also we have the side pottery aperture, which is used to stacking the. Uh, the pottery inside the can. So he moves his, uh, he getting the uh, the uh, dry products, and at least this this phase needs at least three three people in order to or three potters in order to getting the clay from uh, the, the dry clay inside or inside the uh, the can, and in order to stack the the whole products and arrange it. So you you may notice that there is some like. Uh, stones or something here, which actually like uh, uh, whiskers that is being reused again to make like a space between the pottery and the can wall in order to allow for uh, the air, the, the 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 heated air or the hot air to move from the uh, uh, firing firing box to the uh, uh, pottery box. So after. He uh, stuck all the products. He covered it with chaps and uh, with the uh, uh, the wasters. And then he closed the uh, uh, the pottery uh, stacking aperture on the side and is there, and then continuously feeding the the can with the uh, waste fireable uh, materials. And after about like from two up to three hours, it depends really, it varies from uh, whether the firing is in winter or is it in, in summer. So it takes longer in, in winter, like up to three hours. And in summer, it's from two to two to uh, two hours and a half uh, in summer. So, and after doing this, he starts to uh, uh, close the uh, firing feeding aperture here in order to keep the temperature inside uh, the, the can as long as it takes. Then, he he floating the the can products and start to uh, selling it for a middleman trader, but while floating it, he now checking for any uh, any wasters, any cracked, and if he found any, he can just using gamsum or even cement to uh, repair it and then uh, coloring it with uh, oxide. So it's not just about knowing the stages of manufacturing but even about timing it because timing is really important for manufacturing techniques for manufacturing process and also we can understand each phase how much does it take and the how much does it take to have uh, this product from the early phase up to the uh, uh, from the from being a, a clay up to being a fired product and also we can use this timing scheme to as a, a measuring tool for uh, how expert is a potter? So as long as he can produce uh, many products in a very small time, so he can produce this kind of uh, product in like two minutes, five minutes, faster than other one, so he's more skilled. But also we need to add to that the quality of production itself. So if he uh, can produce high quality product in, in, in a less time, so he's more expert than the other one. And also we can understand the workflow and we can understand the uh, object life cycle uh, of the product. So not all of the phases happens in a linear production, but even we can find, for example, in forming stage, it can happen. So we have 
like the first phase forming the vessel itself, the vessel body, and then the vessel has to be dried. And then it should go back again to the workshop and then to, to, to receive the rim or handles, and then going again to the drying session to be dried and then for firing. So we can understand the workflow. We can understand the journey from clay to fire the products, the timing, the phases. And we now understand it's not a liner reduction style, but it's it's interchangeable. And it really depends on what kind of styles of products he's, he's, he's manufacturing. Because some, some styles is a liner production, but others are not. And also we can understand the object life uh, uh, cycle because after being used, after being sold for other for customers, so it's now it could be we, we have two uh, uh, possibilities. The first one, the the customer will be using it for so long time, and then it becomes a wister, so that it can be reused again as uh, uh, as a timber for production, or even it can be cracked after being fired, so that the potter himself will cracking it into very tiny small pieces and then using it in the uh, clay as an opener or as uh, a temper for having a porous product. Then we also can understand the production line and use of the space. So we can have here, the, this is the Marley clay and nine salt to storage area. So it's all started from here. Then moving this clay to the bottling pit. So we're having the bottling pit. Uh, preparing the clay, moving the clay inside the, uh, his workshop, forming the beds, and then moving it out to the open air drying zone. And then it could be moved again to, to, the, uh, to the workshop if it has another phases for manufacturing, or it could just waiting in the uh, open air until it's fully dried and then going to the can so that it is being uh, 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 fired and then sold or even stored for the fire for the uh, fire products uh, storage soon. So we even also can understand the social and spiritual organization of the workshops and how this can relate to the social uh, organization of the potters. So we can in the, in the first model, as uh, uh, for example, the father here is the controller of everything. He owns workshops. He owns even the his sons and everyone because actually it's family business. So. Uh, the sons working for his the, the fathers and they now don't have any authority or power in the workshop they just work they don't receive any salary for doing this but the father is controlling he's getting the clay he's getting the sorry for every raw material used and then he control he owns the, uh, all the workshops he owns the cans he's selling the products and even he owns the house and he also is responsible for the expenses but in other two models this is this is not the case. So potters just or the sons learn from the father and they're moving and having their own uh, their own uh, workshops. They might share the, uh, the the raw material with their father. They might share the can, but they have some kind of independency from their father. And then we have a third model that the the sons are completely independent from uh, dependent from their father, and they have their own workshops. They're getting their own. Uh, 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 raw material and they sell their own products uh, and even they live uh, outside the house of the fathers. And also we can understand the relation between the uh, how the porters uh, understand the environmental context and the environment context around them and how how they trying to mitigate the their, uh, 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 side or, or the uh, uh, the un uh, preferable effects of it, I mean. So, for example, in archaeological context, we usually have the uh, archaeologists usually say that we also, we have the feeding aperture for the fire feeding aperture for the firing box, uh, which is this one, in, in a way that receiving all the wind and using the wind to regulate the air inside and using it to uh, make the, the fire much, much higher or much harder. But from a stenographic uh, study, we now we, we now when I asked them about, is this the case? And they said no. We made this firing aperture in an opposite direction for the wind, which is uh, for this case in Fayum we have a, a, a northern northern direction for the wind. So the wind comes from the northern uh, direction to to the side, which is approximately in this place. And so they made the, the this firing aperture in opposite direction in order to prevent the air or to prevent the wind 
to get inside the uh, the the can so that they can control the wind, they can control the firing, they can control the temperature inside the can. Another thing they mentioned, if they made it in the opposite direction, so the wind will get inside the uh, the can, and this will lead to deterioration of uh, the opposite wall of uh, the firing aperture, and also the fire the, the product itself will not be fired well. And research and the digital tools. This is this is part for the ethnographic study. But what about the uh, the digital tools used for JIS? I use it for mapping the site itself, and then we can understand the we can make a, a illustrative maps, and then we can even move to the site itself and highlighting and uh, the the workshops, and then we can understand and use it for understanding uh, two, two things or two items. The first of all is the spatial analysis of uh, the site, use of space, and even relating it to the social organization. For example, if we looked for this, for this green line, we can now find up to five workshops, which are all of, this, of the same family, which are Actually, most of them are of the same family, it's the Farkh family. But for this, this is the subfamily one, and they have five workshops. They are all scattered in the same place they, because uh, they are using these two cams together. They are using the empty space together for drying and storing the, uh, uh, the, the products so that we can understand how the, uh, the space use uh, in the, in the uh, poetry workshop the locations, and also we can understand the uh, special organization of this workshop because and relating it to their social relations as well. For the photogrammetry uh, uh, part, uh, I made like 3D modeling for for the workshops, so that this we can even for documentation purposes for first of all, and also for analysis purposes. So we I can I can be on the site all the time, but I can view the this 3D model any time that I want. So I can explain the inside the can. I can see I can measure the the can size because measurements. It's really important for us to understand the relation between the measurements of the can to the products, the scale of the production, and even to the size. It could be an indication for what kind of styles and size of products that this site can produce. And we, we can make interpretation for the ancient Egypt and related it to the ancient excavated workshops as well. So we made also the uh, cloud compare or the digital elevation model for uh, the can, and uh, we can infer the, the 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 digital elevation model, and we can use it. And also the dam, uh, sorry, and the, the also photos as well. We can locate it on the uh, and georeferencing it uh, and on the GIS. And also we have, uh, I made also photogrammetry for the workshops. So not all of the workshops, I have photographed all the workshops, but not, not all of that, not all of it has been uh, uh, processed yet, but this is one of uh, one of it. So now I can understand the, I can uh, use it for uh, another vis virtual visiting for the site. I can use it for the measurements. I can use it for presentation and documentation purposes as well. So uh, what is what is what is next? What is next is mapping all the case studies and uh, making side spatial analysis, understanding and visualizing uh, 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 the organization of the poetry workshops, and making documentation and preservation, processing and creating three D models for the workshops, cans and tools and maps, de-referencing all this site making drone photogrammetry for all the uh, case studies, georeferencing uh, all of this, and having uh, uh, having it published for for the, for uh, for people so that they can view it, and adding to this information about the production, adding to this information about the uh, social life, social organization, use of space, production line, and everything. And also, we can, uh, uh, but so far, sorry, <laughs> I'll be having another field work. So, uh, I know this is very, um, I have just started, yeah, I mean, I've just passed my first year, so I'm, I've just started my second year, so there's not a lot of 3D model I know and they uh, use it, but I mean, this will be coming in the next, uh, during this year, uh, hopefully. 
So uh, uh, I hope this presentation was uh, beneficial in any way uh, for any one of you. And I have a room for, as I'm, I've just started my second year as a PhD candidate, I'm really open to any comments, uh, any constructive comments that can help me to develop more my research, to understand more how can I use these tools and how can I develop it for uh, for the best. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, having me, the Sipa Heritage, and thank you, Michelle, for, for facilitating and organizing this uh, this event and also for the expert committee uh, with us and for the attendance as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the very interesting presentation. I'm sure the experts have uh, uh, a lot to say. I'm just going to hand it over to Elise to introduce everybody. You mm -hmm. can go, You sorry, you can leave your presentation up in case they do want to refer to any slides. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just introduce a couple of our experts. Um, Michelle will give some more introductions. Um, and then we'll go through each of the experts and I'll allow each person to give some feedback and um, ask any questions. If you could just keep your comments, each expert to about three minutes. Um, we're just uh, running out of time. Um, and then we'll uh, proceed to Ahmad if you uh, want to address any of the comments and questions at the end. Um, so beginning with our first expert, uh, Mina Silver is an adjunct professor in Near Eastern Archaeology at the University of Ulu, Finland. Uh, she was president of ECOMOS Finland from 2018 to 2019. In 2014, she was a professor at Mardin University in Turkey, and since 2020, she has been on the SIPA Executive Board as the Commission Chair of Application of Recording, Documentation, and Information Management for Cultural Heritage. Uh, Mina has been a leader of many projects in the field of archaeology, including the Sigis Jebel Bishri, the Finnish project in Syria. So thank you, Mina. Uh, I will now introduce Hind Mustafa. Uh, she is a founder and managing director at NADIM Foundation, a nonprofit, non governmental organization aimed at documenting and disseminating heritage, uh, both tangible and intangible. Previously, she worked at the, as the International Relations Manager and Special Project Manager at Coltnats, prominent global position in IT innovation and project management for heritage. Uh, since 20, 2009, she has been responsible for overseeing several projects in collaboration with the American Research Center in Egypt, the Ministry of Endowments, and the Friends of Environment and Development Association. Uh, one such project is the Mazar project, which involves establishing an IT visitor center on Al Muiz Street at the heart of Historic Cairo, dedicated to the documentation and digitization of the area's rich history. And our uh, special uh, Guest expert is Jane Smythe. Uh, she has a visual arts degree in ceramics from Canberra and a master's degree in Egyptology from Macquarie University. Uh, since 1997, she has worked as a ceramic specialist on various European, North American, and Asian archaeological missions in Egypt and the Sudan. Between 2009 and 2017, Jane held the position of Assistant Director of the American Research Center in Egypt. Since leaving ARCE, Jane has been working with the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities as consultant for the Grand Egyptian Museum, the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, and various other state museum projects and international institutes. And I'll let uh, Michelle introduce our CP CPA EP experts. Thanks, Elise. So we have Margarita and Joe with us. Uh, we've invited them because of their expert on in photogrammetry. Uh, so Margarita Skamatsari holds a master's engineering degree in rural surveying and geomatics engineering, as well as as a master's in science in the protection of monuments, conservation, and restoration of historic buildings and sites. She's a research collaborator at the Lab of Photogrammetry of the School of Rural Surveying and Geomatics Engineering in National, uh, at the National Technical University of Athens. In the past four years, she's been working as a freelance consultant in the documentation of monuments. In the last three years, she's worked in various research projects with the responsibility of 3D modeling and reconstruction, geomatic uh, documentation, and laser scanning. So after your second phase, Ahmad, you may want to touch base with Margarita on some modeling. Uh, Joe, Joe Callis is a coordinator uh, with the SIPA Emerging Professionals uh, with me. Uh, he's currently a PhD candidate, PhD candidate at Penn State in architectural engineering, and recently has worked with UNESCO carrying out rapid damage and needs assessment for Ukraine and other post-disaster areas. And as I said, he's uh, an expert in photogrammetry, and um, 
And why don't we uh, get started? Mina, you can start us off with your comments for Ahmad. Thank you, Michelle and Elise, for uh, introducing me. And uh, thank you for organizing this uh, meeting seminar again. And thank you for Ahmed Mohamed for your very nice presentation. Uh, I'm an archaeologist and I have been doing some ethnoarchaeology, but I'm not a uh, pottery specialist, but I was very impressed of your <laughs> presentation. And uh, as you said that you are only doing this for your second year, I was I think that's frozen. Nina, can you hear us? <laughs> uh, okay. Maybe Mina needs to try to log back in. I'll try to send her a message. Um, Should we proceed with uh, Hind can provide some comments and then come back to Mina when she reconnects? Yes. Okay. Hind, are you available to provide comments? Can you hear me? Yes. Ah. Uh, hello. Thank you, uh, Ahmed, for a very interesting uh, presentation. I was really very pleasantly to, uh, surprised to find uh, an Egyptian uh, archaeologist uh, slash ethnographer speaking the language that we've all been missing and uh, uh, that definitely needs to be added to Egyptian discourse and e Egyptian public, uh, public discussion uh, as a whole. Um, I have three kind of very, uh, 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 very quick points. You mentioned um, uh, that the families moved from uh, 50 to 12 and they're now eight. Uh, yeah. this, is, this is a very uh, important challenge, actually. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, you mentioned one of the reasons is the environment, which I'm sure is, is uh, equally valid. But I don't think with pottery, this is the issue. With pottery, you have the problem Maybe you, you may need to tell me after you finish if I'm right or not. Uh, it's, it's the issue of, uh, for example, efficacy and uh, function. Um, the, what you presented are shapes uh, and kilns taken from ancient Egypt, which is very important to document and very important to be inspired by. But actually, people who actually, or who used to actually use these containers uh, now have plastic which is much cheaper and uh, much more durable. So now it's become an item of, uh, a, of leisure, of uh, if you want to put something nice in the garden. But people, uh, the, the original people who used to use this have ceased to use it for, uh, for, for the function of it now. And this is a question that I don't have an answer to, but maybe you can think about it. Or uh, uh, Also another problem for, from the 50 to the eight uh, is the demand. Is demand increasing? I doubt that demand is increasing. And maybe you mentioned also Tunis. Tunis needs a, a study on this because it was a single-handed woman, uh, Evelyn, I'm sure you know of her since you're from yeah. Fayoum. And she created this skill, and she uh, she taught the the young the young ones, and uh, actually she taught uh, women, or rather girls and boys. And now you have Rawia, who exhibits everywhere in the world, and there is a life for for the pottery. I'm not saying every every area should do that, but it is a significantly uh, a well documented and uh, has to be considered uh, example. Uh, what else? Uh, also, I ask myself why why are we documenting? I'm sure we're documenting in order to document, basically to know how people are doing now and to search for the continuity of ancient. Egyptian uh, pottery. I, uh, a, a student and a lover of heritage, I totally support this. 
But lately, I'm start, starting to think that continuity is being overemphasized. Um, and because of that, there is a problem from moving from 50 to 8. We need to, yes, maintain the craft, maintain the intangible heritage related to the craft. But maybe we need to think more practically about the function and how we use it and, and so on. I'm sure you can add more variables uh, than me. Um, a, last, a last comment. I'm, I'm very happy that you're working with GIS because uh, we're, uh, as, as an inhabitant of Cairo, we're losing Cairo. <laughs> so mapping yeah. everything is, is very important now. Uh, so my question to you, will, will there be uh, some somewhere where I can access this very important map and maybe um, have, a, have a conversation with it somehow? Uh, I'm asking this because we are actually working with GIS uh, to try to map the woodwork of historic Cairo. And uh, you would know that sometimes we don't even have the time to do that or the luxury to do that. And I'm hoping when we do have the map, we're going to make it available online on our website. And uh, I'm asking this because it's a, it's a challenge for us. And I, if you also uh, try to figure out a way uh, to make all this information available, it would be great because uh, we're in, yeah, and to put it lightly in a state of chaos where information is available in Cairo and how to access knowledge and who, what, when, and how. We don't, this line, we, we do not have. But other than that, I was very happy uh, listening to what you had to say. And uh, it's a very interesting topic. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you. Uh, should I reply right, right now? Or we'll go our... through, sorry, Ahmad. We'll try to go through all of the experts' comments first and then give you some time okay. at the end if we can uh, for more feedback. Uh, yeah. So. Before Mina, I'm glad you're able to rejoin us. If you'd like to finish your uh, comments from before, please go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Uh, it somehow cut off. I don't know <laughs> what happened with my connection. But anyhow, I, I'm sure the those who are working, especially in Egypt, know much more than me about this subject, uh, but uh, I was very interested in the shapes of the pottery uh, vessels. Uh, I have studied Syria-Palestine uh, EB4, early Bronze Age 4, which is about 2300 to 2000 uh, BC, before Common Era. And we have really similar shapes and uh, similar questions of making the body uh, by hand and and the rim with the wheel and uh, why why people wanted to shape the vessels round to base and uh, uh, there are all kinds of questions uh, can you answer uh, to the question uh, is there some functional purpose in these uh, round-based uh, pottery vessels uh, and um, does it have something to do with uh, uh, people who are um, uh, like Bedouins or, or are moving? Uh, this would interest me. Uh, is there a difference of settled people and the moving people using pottery? Thanks. Thanks, Mina. Um, and if we can proceed to Jane, if you would like to provide some comments. Hi, thank you, Ahmed. Thank you very much for your um, presentation. Um, I straddle both worlds because I've worked on archaeological pottery in Egypt. My speciality is first dynasty pottery and early dynastic pottery, which is mostly handmade. Um, but I'm also a potter. Um, and I've continued my craft and I've visited Nasla both um, out of interest, but also um, with university students talking about the space and the work they're doing. 
Um, I'm assuming that you you may have had a had a try of making pottery, but you're I'm assuming that you're not a potter yourself. Um, so you've had to learn all of this um, through your readings and through your talkings. And what I will do is commend you highly on talking and listening to a potter because a lot of academics don't do that. So bravo. Um, I will say that and I would I would encourage you to continue doing that. I would also encourage you quite strongly not just to talk to the potters at El Nasla and Tunis, and Tunis, of course, is a very different model, um, but also I'm not sure if you're in the UK or you're in Egypt. You're in the UK? Yeah, currently I'm in the UK. Okay, so I would take an opportunity to go to a pottery centre to talk to real potters, to talk to also potters in, in the UK. I would suggest you even do a presentation for them because what you'll find is that potters are extremely um, collaborative um, and they'll give you so much more questions to take back to Egypt with you. Um, they will also discuss the finer points of each of the processes that you dis that you described today, because essentially the craft is a craft and, and, and craftspeople do things for reasons. And one of those reasons is economy, which leads me to a couple of other issues. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one thing uh, that I will suggest is that the, the pots from Nasla have always had a problem with the firing because they are not fired to a high temperature, as you know. Um, and I know that in the 80s there was a there was a, a um, an attempt to try and solve that problem because they were selling these pots abroad, and of course, within a couple of months, with these beautiful pots on people's balconies, um, they didn't last very long. Um, and you will see it as well when you go to Nasla. There's a lot of salt problems, and Egypt traditionally has a lot of salt within its clay body, even the pharaonic uh, material. So uh, the potters at Nasla probably won't talk about this um, because also potters, you know, they want to show you how well they're doing. Um, so these are things to keep in mind. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, so I, I agree completely with Hind with the continuity problem, as you know, in Egypt, mm -hmm. aluminium and plastic, are, you know, um, and the shapes. With, with regard to the shapes, the use of different um, uh, different techniques, hand building and wheel, wheel making, this is about economy, um, but also it's about speed. So making a pot with a rounded base is a lot quicker than making one with a flat base. Um, and I think this is universal. Um, let me think. Uh, experimental archaeology, I would... I would advise be very careful with experimental archaeology. A lot of people do it once and call it a success, um, which isn't really not the case. Um, craft takes a long time to actually do and learn. So um, observation is usually better than experimental archaeology for someone that's not a crafts person. And that's where talking to the potters in Nasla is, is and listening to them more, moreover, is so important, but also talking to other um, proper crafts people. And I'm talking about studio potters, not, not necessarily artists, but real studio potters. And you'll find them all over the place in the UK. Um, what else? Another piece of information. Just one little thing that I would suggest as a potter. When you need something, you're adding air to it, like you need dough. You add air to it. Potters don't need air in their clay. Um, we call it wedging because yeah. we're wedging the air out of the clay. So, um, and this is a lot of academics have this problem because needing is putting air into something and that's actually not what you need. So just, just that. When you said kneading, I, <laughs> I was like, Ugh. <laughs> so because I'm just know, I'm not a native speaker, you know, but yeah, no, 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 it's fine. No, it's not. Yeah. Most academics call it kneading, and yeah. uh, Janine Brorio used to call it kneading, and then she thankfully she changed to wedging. So it, it's not a language thing, it's 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 an academic thing. Um, mm. and any potter would will will tell you that if you talk 
to an English speaking pot are, of course, French and German. They have different, but it's actually getting the in English. It's 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 getting um, uh, the the. The, the air bubbles out, not putting them in. My yeah. scones look like Welsh cakes because I can't make I can't make scones or 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 bread because I'm a wedger, not a kneader. Um, so I think I think that is. I can just offer you uh, encouragement, and um, and I, I one of my major suggestions is while you're in the UK, go and find. Uh, studio potters, people that actually do that, do that work, and go and talk to them. Present, do your presentation, and and you'll be amazed at at the type of um, interest and and help you'll get. We'll do so. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jane, for all of your comments. I think it sounds very constructive for Ahmed. Uh, so I'll just give a moment to Margarita to offer any final comments. Um, Joe is providing some feedback in the chat. And then um, I think we're just about at two o'clock here. So if uh, after Margarita's comments, Amma, do you want to take one minute to address anything? Um, otherwise, we can uh, wrap it up. So please go ahead, Margarita. Thank you. Thank you so much for the nice, interesting presentation. And congratulations on the work that you have done so far, it's really impressive. Um, what actually came into my mind, except the technical stuff on photogrammetry and uh, 3D modeling on um, the objects themselves. I mean, you have the, the pottery, you have the structures, that's fine. Um, I think Joe will uh, give you all the suggestions about those, uh, but I don't know if you have considered um, doing some research on maybe how not you, but someone else could um, document, 3D document uh, the intangible part of um of this process, uh, you described uh, with photos really nice the way that someone uh, moves um, or uh, how they work with their hands and feet. Um, so there are ways to actually document, 3D document uh, these, these techniques and uh, uh, the moves in order to somehow safeguard and keep in time, uh, through time, the um, the way they do it uh, somehow. So uh, maybe one thing that you could do during your um, during this research uh, would be to find um, a, a proper workflow or suggest a workflow on how someone could document that. Uh, it's not easy. That's why I'm not saying that you could do it, but. Uh, uh, propose something since you are uh, an expert now or trying to be an expert on how they're doing it. So that would be uh, quite interesting to do, to me at least. Thank you. Uh, can I yeah, answer your, your comments now? Yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for attending or commenting on, on my presentation. And uh, I'm really glad that uh, that you have been here and really honored that I have received all these comments uh, so that I can develop uh, my research more. So I will start by a uh, hand as uh, she has, uh, or no, sorry, uh, and I would start with Mina because she started uh, first. So me and she talk about the shapes around the base and the uh, uh, why she it is round and uh, why we have uh, we don't have flat and is it has any technicality or something like this so um i would just take from uh, jane uh, uh, comments so jane mentioned that the uh, round base is always related to the uh, um uh, it's much faster to to produce because it's really related to the forming bed so uh, this kind of it's and it's a hand building so we have a the uh, the bed the bed which is round so he used the the specific amount of clay using the mold and start pinching and using the the oval shape of of, of the bed itself but he also can make the flat based so the flat base if he wanted to create one so it is based on or related to uh, customer demand. So if customer need flat base, 
So I'm going after forming it, having the uh, the wooden tool, which is the Tara, and keep uh, uh, like uh, just uh, like pinching on on the base until to be flat. But I'm agree that it's not like um, it is. It is. It's not like from technical perspective, it's related to the uh, to the forming pad. But from practicality, it it could be not the best. But in in in, in agriculture perspective, they always use it in a very. Uh, they have they made like um, this forming pad in the in the in the farms, and then it is well suited and well uh, controlled in this in this pet. So. Uh, they make sure that it won't move so because they're having the forming pet in the, in the farms and placing it in the farms. And even if the if it is in the house, they have like uh, a specific uh, base for it so that they use the base and the and the uh, and the object itself. So the oval shape of it just fit, fit inside the the base, so it won't move. So it is uh, it well suited and uh, stable enough. And uh, for hand comments, I'm I'm really glad for uh, for all of you for your comments and especially for Dr. Hans. You mentioned about the family uh, decrease from fifty to twelve, and then and then uh, eight family just working. And actually, it's it's uh, as I mentioned, it's not just related to the environmental factors uh, and the Ministry of Environment that preventing them for for uh, for firing, but also it's related to the to the demand. So we have. Uh, low demand on the in the product, as uh, as you mentioned, that it's related to the functionality and the uh, it's not related to the um, uh, um, uh, the oh sorry because of the low demand. So uh, people are not any longer, especially uh, if they are in the city and the town, they're not any longer using such uh, such styles or such uh, 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 pots in their houses, unless they are using it just for decoration purposes. But in, in the villages, some of them is still using it. We are we are talking about the uh, villagers. So villagers are not like uh, the city inhabitants. So so oh, they're still up to now using it. However, there is still low demand on that. But it's related. If 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 we, you mentioned also about the continuity, so the continuity problem actually we could view it from two perspectives. The first of all, for interpretation, we are not. I'm I'm doing uh, interpretation. I'm not explaining the ancient. So the continuity. I'm I'm not saying that the ancient Egyptian supporters do the same exactly as the contemporary potters, but they quite similar to the ancient because we have different two different contexts. We have two different historical uh, his, uh, like uh, um, a political uh, regime. We have different uh, environmental contexts. We have different social contexts. So, however, but we still have the techniques itself. The techniques survived over this long uh, uh, time, but the context itself somehow it changed. But regarding the continuity from the other perspective is the uh, continuity of using this techniques. So, uh, most of the styles right now is not being used from being a uh, um, usable uh, uh, product, but as a decoration or decorative product more than it's a usable product. However, as I mentioned, in the villages, it is still being used as a usable and functional uh, products, not decoration products. Uh, yes, I'm sure. Uh, I'm really glad that I can uh, I can help with the GIS for Cairo, and also I I would just quickly mentioning that I'm now working on. Uh, a project for documenting uh, the heritage at risk uh, of uh, uh, of Cairo's Islamic heritage, uh, which is now at risk, and we are collaborating and uh, writing uh, a project uh, with uh, Institute in Oman and the Durham University. I'm trying to get them on board, and I'm trying to apply it for the British Council to get the fund for fast uh, documentation. We are going to do photogrammetry, laser scanning, JS, and ethnographic documentation for the inhabitants to get the people experience for the site. So I can help with the GIS, uh, Dr. Hand, and also if you would like to know more about the Kairos project, I'm glad to provide more information and even we can discuss it. Um, Ahmad, thanks so much. Just because of the time, if you, we should respect the, the one hour for everybody. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. If you've got further comments, we'll be happy to connect everybody offline. And uh, Elise, 
thank you for and Elise and Dina really put this this session together. And uh, to all our experts, thank you so much. Your the the comments are very um, constructive, and Ahmad, I'm sure you have a lot to take with you uh, to your second year and third or how, however long <laughs> your PhD will last. So we'll just wrap up the session. Um, and Can I at least add something just to Jane, please? If yes, so. yes. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. So uh, for Jane, you mentioned that I have to listen more for voters. I totally agree. The more that uh, ethnographers stay in the field, the more he knows much better about the social relations and the technicality of production itself. So I have I've just gone through the the production presentation very fast, but there is a lot of details that I haven't mentioned. And actually, you you want you want say it and notice it until you stay in the field more days and build the, this kind of a strong bond between you and uh, your participants or the, your uh, investigated community. So I totally agree with you for this and I will take your your uh, advice for the uh, st visiting study or uh, UK Potter study. So thank you so much. Thanks, Ahmad. And we're going to save that chat for you. So all of Joe's points, yeah, you can read over them. And uh, you. you can connect with Joe and Margaret at any time through us. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.